Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for having us, Apple, Matt, and the team. We are super excited to be here and really excited that all of you turned up and that it's not just Warby employees that are in the audience. <laughs> to be honest, I thought there'd be like my husband and three Warby employees, so this is pretty awesome. Thank you all so much for being here. Um, we are very excited to be part of this Meet the Innovators series. And for those of you who are not familiar with Warby Parker, we sell, we design and sell $95 prescription eyewear right down the street at Green Street. So after you're done with this series, hopefully you can pop by the store and check it out if you don't know it already. Um, today we're going to spend some time talking with Neil and Dave about how they came up with the idea to sell glasses online. Uh, how the company has evolved in just the past three years that we've been in business, and also talk about how technology plays a really important role in the work that we do. So with that, you know, Neil and I have had the pleasure of knowing each other for a few years now, and um, when I learned that he was starting a company with Dave and Andy and Jeff selling prescription eyewear for $95, I thought to myself, how is this possible? That is just crazy talk because every time I bought glasses, it's 400 bucks, embarrassingly, um, or more. And so I would love to know from you guys if you can just tell us all a little bit about how you were able to keep the prices so low. Sure. So yeah, we each had that frustrating experience walking into an optical shop, getting really excited about a pair of glasses, and then sort of walking out feeling like we got ripped off. Um, and we knew there had to be a better way. Uh, and so what we decided to do is basically shrink the value chain. So we design all of our frames ourselves, and then we work directly with manufacturers, um, and then sell directly to our customers, primarily through WarbyParker.com, but we've now opened up a bunch of stores. And what this has effectively done done is uh, sort of cut out that middle part where most uh, brands will wholesale their glasses to a third party who then in turn mark up the glasses three to five times. So what we're effectively doing is selling glasses at wholesale. Um, and then because it's all under the Warby Parker brand, we don't have to pay to license another brand. So when you're typically buying you know, those Ralph Lauren glasses or those Chanel glasses, it's actually another company that is making those glasses and then paying a licensing fee to that brand. So take us back, you know, three and a half years, the first few weeks after you guys launched, what was that experience like? Yeah, so uh, it was me, Neil, and, and our uh, two other founders. We were all just buddies in business school and came up with this idea. We were just frustrated with how expensive glasses were and didn't make any sense to us that uh, people weren't selling glasses online and thought that by creating our own brand and selling them direct to, to consumers, um, we could take billions of dollars of, of profits that were going into uh, uh, the, the balance sheet of a couple large companies and transfer that back to consumers. And uh, so we, we launched, we were full-time students working out of our apartments. Uh, we were fortunate enough to be featured in GQ and Vogue the week we launched. And the first couple of days we were expecting one or two orders a day and started getting hundreds of orders just pouring in from these features. We ended up hitting our first year sales targets in three weeks. Um, and we were full-time students. We didn't have any employees, didn't have an office. We were staying up all night, uh, responding to customer emails, packing boxes, trying to figure out uh, kind of how to run this business that we thought uh, we would have uh, the first few months to, to figure out as our sales slowly ramped up. And so uh, it was incredibly exhilarating. It was uh, trying, to, trying to make sure that we graduate from school um, while also keeping our customers happy. Did you guys graduate? I think so. I still haven't seen Neil's <laughs> diploma, though. Just really matter. <laughs> um, so as many of you may know, we also, for every pair of glasses that we sell, we also distribute one to a person in need through one of our partners, Vision Spring. And Neil, you worked at Vision Spring. That's actually how we met years ago when you were working there. Can you tell us a little bit about your background at Vision Spring and why social good and doing social good is so important to Warby Parker, how it sort of permeates the culture? Sure. So when we were building Warby Parker, the, the question was, uh, how can we build an organization where uh, we would personally want to come to work every day and not just turn over and sort of hit the snooze button and, and go back to sleep? Uh, and it really came down to having a, a positive impact. Um, and one of the things that we were all too aware of was that there's over 700 million people on the planet that don't have access to glasses. And to us, that's just mind boggling, right? We are failing as a species 800 years since the invention of glasses that not everybody has access to them. Um, so 
we were when we were deciding sort of how to do good because we knew we wanted to do it within the organization we thought that it made the most sense to commit to distributing a pair of glasses for every pair that we sold uh, because we realized that that would result in actual human being getting glasses being able to see the chalkboard if they were in school or being able to be productive in the workplace and thought that that would be the way to have the best impact versus you know giving a percent of profits or a percent of revenue because uh, one of the things that we're thinking is that what if in the really long term we're not running the company anymore, right? Those, uh, those types of metrics can be manipulated, but not distributing a pair for every pair that we sold. Uh, once we committed to do that, the question was, how can we do it in the most effective way? Uh, because having done some international development myself, you realize that sometimes good intentions have unintended consequences. So for us, it wasn't just about parachuting in and dropping off uh, a bunch of glasses for free in a community. Uh, it was about using glasses to create jobs and foster economic development. So on a monthly basis, we tally up the number of glasses that we've sold, and we make a cash donation uh, to a nonprofit called Vision Spring uh, to allow them to procure that number of glasses. Um, and what Vision Spring does is they have staff on the ground in places like India and Bangladesh and El Salvador and, and many other developing countries, and they train low-income men and women to start their own businesses, giving eye exams and selling glasses at an affordable price to people in their communities. So I know the answer to this, but I think it's a pretty exciting statistic. Um, how many have we given away to uh, date? We've now given away over 500,000 pairs of glasses, which is pretty exciting. Pretty cool. You know, I was fishing for the claps, but I think that's pretty awesome. Um, so in the last five months, we've opened four retail stores, uh, which is really kind of a crazy pace of, of a retail rollout for us. And it, since we just started the company three years ago, it's a pretty impressive feat, I think. Um, so Dave, could you talk a little bit more about the decision to go from online to offline? Sure. Um, so one of the original pillars of our, our business model was that we could effectively sell glasses online. So at the time, less than 1% of all glasses in the US were sold online. And if you uh, compare that to other consumer products categories, um, most of those uh, categories were between 5 and 30% um, e-commerce and we thought that by really focusing on a customer experience providing a, just a really easy to use website offering a virtual try on where um, we have some pretty cool facial recognition technology people could upload a photo of their face and virtually fit the glasses on our site and offering the first of its kind home try on where uh, customers could select any five frames from our site we'd send them for free including a free return shipping label um, that we would enable customers to uh, have a great experience buying glasses online for the first time. And I think we, we found that, uh, that we were right, and, and um, people have really gravitated towards buying, um, uh, buying glasses online, and we've been growing a lot faster than we ever expected over the first um, kind of three years that, that we launched. Uh, but we also came to realize that a lot of customers um, still prefer uh, the bricks and mortar shopping experience, so walking into a store, being able to touch and feel every one of our glasses, being able to talk to people behind the brand. And we kind of stumbled uh, into that uh, accidentally. So uh, because of these great features in GQ and Vogue around our launch, uh, we had just significantly kind of orders of magnitude more volume than we were expecting. Um, and within 48 hours, we had to effectively turn off our home try-on program because we had 20,000 people sign up on a wait list. Um, and we had basically 100 of each style ready to go. Um, and we started getting calls from people around Philadelphia saying, I read about you in GQ. I read about you in Vogue. I tried to sign up for a home try-on. Uh, it's unavailable. Can I come to your store? And we said, well, the store is my apartment or Neil's apartment, uh, but come on over. And so we had all these strangers from all over Philadelphia come into our apartments, laid out the glasses on our dining room table, and found that people love the experience of getting to meet uh, the people behind the brand. Um, and I think every one of those customers ended up buying at least one pair of glasses. A lot of people bought multiple pairs. And so when we moved to our first office here in New York, we dedicated a portion of that office to a customer showroom. Um, and even though it was on the sixth floor of a commercial building with no signage, uh, we were getting hundreds of people a day uh, through the door. And it's so much so that our landlord threatened to evict us because uh, we were just dominating the, uh, the elevator traffic. 
Um, and since then, we've also done a couple pop-up shops. Um, we uh, bought this yellow school bus that we call the Warby Parker class trip. Uh, we completely gutted the interior, turned it into a beautiful mobile store that's been touring the country. Um, it's now in Chicago, I think on its 15th city, um, basically setting up pop-up shops in different cities around, um, around the US. And, and, and every time we do, um, we've tried kind of a, a physical experience, have an opportunity for customers to come in and interact um, in a physical environment, we found that customers loved it, uh, interacting with our brand that way, and it gave us the confidence to open our first store, actually right around the corner um, on Green between uh, Prince and Houston, about 10 feet from here. Um, and that opened in April, and we've been blown away uh, by the amount of traffic and sales that that store has generated, and also just kind of the halo effect that we've seen um, for, for our brand uh, beyond just the immediate reach um, here in Soho. And uh, since that time, we've, we've opened three additional stores, one on Washington Street in Meatpacking, one on Newberry Street in Boston, and one in LA um, in West Hollywood. And um, we've just seen a, a ton of synergies between uh, being able to offer a great experience online and a great experience offline. And think just the future of our business and all retail is going to uh, just offer uh, great product, great service, great experience where your customers want to interact with your brand. And, and um, consumers are never going to do all their shopping online. They're never going to do it all offline. Um, so if we can just be where our customers are um, and offer a consistent, great experience, um, then we're, we'll be able to achieve all our goals. And so um, we think physical retail um, is going to play a much bigger part in our business going forward. We're looking for uh, additional retail locations. And um, I think sitting in the store right now is probably the best uh, example of, of how a company can really think about uh, providing an omni-channel experience for, uh, for consumers. And I think you know, Apple really reinvented the way that um, people in the consumer electronics space think about retail. And I think we're trying to do the same thing um, in the eyeglass industry. Um, so, Lon, with this, the recent store launches, as the technical head of our company, can you talk a little bit about what your involvement has been? Yeah, so it's uh, been kind of challenging to keep up with these two guys. Uh, so as they're trying to innovate and think of new ways to sell eyeglasses, we're trying to think of how we can uh, leverage technology to keep up with Warby Parker and then also be uh, innovative in the retail space. So in uh, retail, for example, we've decided to build our own point of sale system. Uh, which is actually built on top of iPads because it's, it's some of the most amazing mobile technology. And so we've had to find people in the engineering department who are thinking um, like entrepreneurs, thinking when can they leverage off the shelf to go fast and really focus on minimum viable product, which is uh, a phrase that everybody beats up, but something that you actually need to do in order to move as fast as a business like Warby Parker. Um, yeah, and then also there's uh, situations where we need engineers who are able to build it themselves. So actually in the case when we first built the draft of the point of sale, we actually got in and soldered all the wires ourselves and vacuum sealed the plastic ourselves. I'm sure that's really exciting to the engineers. I have no idea what that means, but I'm glad somebody else was doing it. I have me. a diagram. Okay, thank you. Um, so technology is obviously a big part of our business, which people wouldn't necessarily expect from an eyeglass company, um, particularly things like facial re recognition software. So can you tell us a little bit about the decision to invest in that technology in particular and others that we might be contemplating? It is. Uh, when I started hiring people at Warby Parker, uh, one of the first questions I'd often get is, wait, uh, why does an eyeglass company need a software developer? Uh, and they would ask us, you know, what kind of software was going into our frames. The, the reality is we do um, a lot of different technology, but I'm not talking about our frames. So we do use computer vision. Uh, we use computer vision in a number of different areas. Um, but we also do data science, and we're doing architecture. And as I said, we're even doing some hardware engineering. So in the case of computer vision, it's just an example where we're looking out into the industry and saying, where can software and hardware engineering move Warby Parker ahead for the benefit of the customer? So in the case of Virtual Tryon, you can actually go on our website, you can upload a picture of yourself, and you can see what our frames would look like on your face, um, which is just a nice way to say you don't have to go into a store, you don't have to do our home try-on program. You can do it from the comfort of your office chair at home in your pajamas. Um, and so from there, a lot of customers find that they do like them, and then they'll try the home try-on, and they'll go into the store. And we're looking for further use of technology to leverage in the store for the customer to make the experience that much better. So first step was to get to a price point that's really amazing, and now it's to find a way of shopping that's really special and unique. 
And similar you know, to the point about Apple, when you look around this store, it's, it's clearly a unique and amazing experience. And we want to have something just like that for the eyeglass space um, universally uh, throughout the website or in the store or on the phone or an email or social media or any way that customers interact with Warby Parker. So to the point on customer experience, I mean, I think what you're seeing obviously in this store and in other stores um, in this area are that customers are gravitating more and more towards experiences up to really top-notch customer experiences. And that's certainly something that we really pride ourselves on at Warby Parker. Um, can you guys talk a little bit about how we try to stay ahead of the curve on that and how do we continue to deliver exceptional customer experience across the board? I think there's an, uh, a Buddhist saying that sort of approach problems with a beginner's mindset. And, you know, when we entered uh, sort of fashion and, and eyewear, we were beginners and um, we weren't experts. And it allows you to sort of look at things in a, in a completely new way. Um, and that's how we are sort of trying to always sort of remind ourselves to sort of not look at things with sort of all that baggage of, of experience and to try and say, how can we do this better? So uh, when you walk into a typical optical shop, there's literally a thousand different pairs of glasses. The average optical shop has somewhere between 700 and 1,000 pairs of glasses. They're often in these glass displays or on a shelf behind a counter out of reach. Um, when, when you look at that, you think, well, how do I shop for other products? Well, I like to touch them. I like to feel them. So uh, in our stores, we've made uh, all the glasses sort of readily available, put uh, lots of light and full-length mirrors because counterintuitively, you know, people don't want to just see their face, they want to see their entire body. Um, and then think about how can we use a lot of the tools that we use on our website in our stores. So uh, on the website, you're constantly looking at conversion, right? The number of people hitting the website to who's buying it. We're now able to monitor the number of people that are walking down the street to the number of people that are entering the store to see like, hey, is there a different uh, window display that might work better? And then we're able to see the number of people that enter the store uh, who actually buys. And we look at that conversion rate and we uh, adjust sort of staffing patterns uh, accordingly. Um, you can book an appointment to have an eye exam online. And then the question is, how do you make that appointment board sort of fun and, and something different that people want to talk about? Can you tell us a little bit about the appointment board? Because it's so fun. Sure. Fun. So uh, when you make an appointment, you come in and you'll see this display. Um, and it kind of looks like an old uh, train board, a, a, a Solari one to be exact. Um, and it was uh, inspired by uh, Dave and I went to school with Jeff and Andy down in Philadelphia and we were constantly coming up to New York and you take the train from 30th Street Station in Philadelphia and had one of these boards where every time there's a new train uh, it sort of clicks, goes tick, 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 tick. And um, we now every 15 minutes in the store sort of update to see sort of when your appointment is and, and what time it is. And it's just uh, a, a nice and different interaction that people often want to talk about and, and ultimately just smile about. Um, so last question for me before we open it up to Q&A. So get your questions ready. I know you have a lot of burning ones. I can tell by your faces. Um, so it's been three and a half years since Warby Parker started. What has been the most defining moment you guys have had so far? Apart from this moment right here. <laughs> Uh, for me, it was when we launched Warby Barker. It was April Fool's, and we created a fake website for dog glasses, and people thought it was real. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I think for me, it was um, yeah the first time that I um, actually went abroad uh, to visit one of our nonprofit partners, and um, and Neil had spent five years working for Vision Spring, and actually put uh, a lot of these. Um, systems and, and people in place that are, are doing amazing work. But uh, now for um, all our employees on their three-year anniversary, um, we will fly them to a place like uh, Guatemala um, and go out into, uh, into rural villages along with our nonprofit partners uh, to actually understand um, how these nonprofits are training locals to become entrepreneurs and, and sell glasses into their community and, and talk to some of the people on the ground there, uh, both people um, buying the glasses that um, our work in the office every day is, is contributing to, but um, also the people that are now um, fully employed and 
um, and are kind of pillars of their community um, and uh, just have a ton of respect and, and pride in what they're doing. And so uh, I think being able to see that firsthand was, was just really powerful for me and, um, and I think just really inspiring uh, to know that kind of all the work that we're doing here in New York is having um, a much greater impact around the world. So I was going to say Warby Barker, and I can't possibly top that. Uh, so I'll just say uh, a little over a year and a half ago when I first came in for my first in-person interview, when Khaki, who's here somewhere, uh, ran up and gave me a big hug, um, and I said, this is the company I want to work at. And now when I'm interviewing people, um, it's a frequent question from candidates. Uh, what's different about Warby Parker? Why would I want to work there? I can easily tell that story and explain Do you that. Give them a hug? will hug you every day. I, I'll hug everyone <laughs> in the audience right after this, uh, just to demonstrate. But War Warby Parker um, hires the kind of people that really care about other people. And in my experience, that's one of the most defining moments for my career. And joining Warby Parker was knowing that the culture is really amazing and special. Awesome. I didn't get a hug. I'm just pointing that out wherever you are, Khaki. Khaki getter. I know, after this. Uh, so with that, do you guys have any questions for us? Hi. Um, Dave, you mentioned that you desire to make a world impact. And besides indulging in philanthropy in developing countries, I was curious if you were going to grow Warby Parker internationally into other countries, including first world countries. and developing countries? Yeah, so, um, you know, we, we try to think about um, building a business that just does good in the world, and that starts with our customers by offering a great product and, and at a great price and, and, and offering great service behind it, uh, but then also thinking about the other stakeholders, so um, the environment. We've been 100% carbon neutral since we launched the company. Um, thinking about our employees and, and really investing in their professional development. Um, and then uh, kind of the last bucket uh, we broadly define as community, and, and part of that is our buy, uh, our buy a pair, give a pair program, uh, but we also try to get involved with uh, local organizations here, whether it's mentoring um, at-risk youth through organizations like Network for Teaching Entrepreneurship or um, activating our team um, around something like Hurricane Sandy where um, we had uh, you know, dozens of our employees out in um, some of the areas that were, were most impacted. We um, helped buy some uh, solar powered light bulbs and uh, try to get people kind of back, back on their feet that were really impacted. And, um, and so we're kind of constantly thinking about how we can use our organization as a vehicle uh, to do good, whether that's in our backyard or, or around the globe. Um, and in terms of getting involved in other kind of first world countries, um, we absolutely think that Warby Parker is going to be a global brand right now. Um, all our operations are in the U.S. Uh, we only ship to the U.S. and Canada, uh, but we do expect to uh, expand internationally, both in terms of um, offering our product to customers, but also the impact um, that we can have through our, our nonprofit partners and uh, through kind of a just broader impact on, on communities. Um, yeah. Uh, I love your, your product and, uh, and your business. It's just fabulous. Um, if I was on Shark Tank, I'd like to talk a minute about the business aspects, how you got started uh, in terms of funding, um, how that happened, and how your sales went, and maybe how they're doing and how profitable you are. If, whatever you can feel you're free to share. Sure. So um, we started about three and a half years ago. Uh, it took us about uh, a year and a half to actually to build the brand architecture, come up with a name. It took us six months alone to come up with a name. We went through 2,000 different names. Um, and we really, in the beginning, just invested in three things, sort of our first collection, uh, sort of designing it and, and producing it, uh, a website so we had we could sell our eyewear, and then uh, PR, uh, sort of hiring a PR firm so that we, we could properly launch the brand. Uh, we each sort of put in our life savings into the company, uh, um, about uh, $120,000, um, and then uh, we're able to support the business um, for about 15 months before we raise our first sort of outside capital, and that's because the business was uh, doing so well. We ended up getting a loan from a bank, which was a complete nightmare um, 
because we didn't have two years of tax returns, and this was 2010, right after the financial crisis, um, and uh, all the banks had really pulled back. Um, we've now done a few rounds of, of financing and, and have raised about $55 million, uh, most of which is sort of sitting in the, in the bank account ready to get deployed as we continue to grow. Is part of your business plan to allow people to custom design their own eyewear and uh, eyeglass uh, frames and then either pick them up at the store or have them sent or and maybe for you to maybe eventually adopt some of those designs and use them yourself and kind of partner with the consumer and why aren't the two of you wearing glasses I want to know and I hope you're all wearing your I own I have perfect your vision is why I could be a pilot <laughs> and I don't want to make her feel bad <laughs> thanks yeah, so uh, on the question around um, are, are we thinking about crowdsourcing designs and letting people submit their own designs, um, right now that's not in our plans. We really think of ourselves as a, as a fashion brand and um, think that one of our core competencies is, um, is the de design aspect. And um, so we do all the design in-house, uh, actually right down the street here in Soho, um, and pride ourselves on kind of our team's ability to, to design beautiful glasses. Um, so you know, I think down the road there might be some options for customization, whether that's um, kind of engraving temples or, or um, something like that. But um, right now we, we don't have any plans to, to crowdsource the design aspect. Hi. Um, so I have a quick question for all of you. You're a fashion company and an eyewear company. At what point did you decide that, oh, I'm a fashion company, but I need a VP of technology. Because um, you don't traditionally see that in the traditional fashion companies. Yeah. I, I think we've always been in the business of creating sort of awesome experiences. And uh, we've always seen technology as a tool to create awesome experiences. So uh, e-commerce allowed us to create direct relationships with customers. Um, and that was technology. And uh, we also recognized the limits of technology. So when we were uh, sort of building our, our website and, and our strategy, uh, we thought, you know, how could people feel comfortable buying glasses online? Would they actually you know, be comfortable because of fit? You know, glasses are such a core part of one's identity. And that's when we found sort of the, some facial recognition software where you could do a virtual try-on. Um, and we were really excited. But then we sort of slept on it and, and looked at each other in the face after sort of using it over and over again and say, like, would we really feel comfortable buying uh, glasses just using this tool? And we thought, you know what, maybe not. And that sort of created a lot of doubt in ourselves and you know should we keep investing our life savings into this business and that's where we came up with the idea to do a home try on to select five frames and you have five days to try it on at home with no obligation to buy um, that was just an example I think of the limitations of technology but you see that um, you know we can help you sort of choose uh, what pair of glasses to put in your home try on uh, by uh, through our data science team. And uh, we can continue to use technology to create better and better experiences. And that was always our, our belief, but to look at things holistically. So from day one, we just tried to build out that team as, as fast as humanly possible. And I think to your question around when, when did we decide to hire a VP of technology, um, I think the answer is not early enough. Um, yeah. And so none of us on the founding team are technical. And <laughs> uh, we. Yeah, we were launching a website, and um, none of us had done that before. We couldn't build it ourselves, and so uh, we outsourced um, kind of all the technology infrastructure um, and development early on. And, and our site was live for about nine months before we hired our first uh, our first engineer. And then uh, sometime after that, we hired Lon, and he's done a great job of of building a world class technology team here in New York, of around 50 people. Um, but I think. We, uh, he was fighting an uphill battle based on some of the technical decisions that um, Neil and I made early on. And, and so I think in retrospect, we, we definitely would have invested more in technology earlier on. And then any business faces technology challenges, but one that's growing as fast as us has numerous. So I would say you can always use a technologist, whether in-house or outsourced. So I don't think there were any mistakes. I, I think we got to where we are because of the decisions. But we're facing tons of technology challenges every day. 
Um, so one of the ways that the tech team is trying to do good is we're actually just launching a tech blog right now uh, called theoculus.com. And if you go there, you can see some of the challenges that we're facing today. And what we're trying to do is tell everybody in, in forums like this, but on the blog as well, um, about the solutions we've come up with. And I think that's kind of an abstract to your question. You know, how do you solve all these challenges and what do the challenges look like for a company like us? And another thing that we're doing is we're also starting to give away some of the technology we're building. Uh, so just in the same way we're starting to give away um, essentially vision to the world, we're trying to give away our technology as well. And so uh, one of the platforms that we use right now is Magento, which runs our e-commerce business. And there were some pieces that we thought we could leverage, and so we decided to build them. And again, to my previous point, it's always a question of uh, build versus buy. And there were some areas where we built. And now if you go to github.com slash Warby Parker, um, you can see some of what we're uh, giving away. Uh, hi there. You mentioned that the uh, Give a Pair program uh, often takes the form of donations to uh, third parties that help uh, bring glasses to other parts of the world. Can you give us an idea per pair of glasses how much that typically amounts to approximately? So um, the short answer is actually no, um, uh, because it, it, we just don't want to disclose exactly how much it costs us to produce glasses. And um, also, same with our, our nonprofit partners, because we think that can be easily mis misinterpreted. Um, but there's a, a lot of costs that go into it from sort of the production to shipping to you know training people. Um, but we are able to sort of do this and support our nonprofit partners while sort of having a, a pretty healthy gross margin uh, on our product. And I think you know one of the reasons why we wanted um, why we settled on the buy a pair give a pair program kind of out out of all the ways that our company could be a for profit entity and and support nonprofits is we really want to measure what we're doing in terms of impact um, instead of um, just kind of dollars and cents donated um, and uh, giving. Uh, and giving someone a pair of glasses or selling them a pair of glasses is one of the most effective poverty alleviation tools in the world. It's been uh, proven to uh, increase someone's income by 20 to 35 percent. And so um, just thinking about um, the impact that we're having um, on um, each, each recipient or each uh, buyer through our buy a pair, give a pair program is, um, is kind of much more meaningful than, uh, than kind of the, the dollars donated to a certain cause. Hi, um, I had a question regarding your marketing and social media, actually. I know that I've really admired your like marketing practices and social media techniques from your consumer-generated content to your, your customer service um, via Twitter. And I was just wondering if you could speak to, a little to where that strategy came from. Is it like innate marketing instincts or was it more um, like from your original team or did you hire an outside team? I'd love to say that it was all incredibly <laughs> thoughtful and, and deliberate, um, but what, what I think we did early on was establish some core values that could guide the company uh, in the hopes of um, you know, trying to distribute decision making as uh, sort of thoroughly throughout the organization as possible. And one of those core values is to treat others the way that we want to be treated. Um, and that very much applies to how you market to them. Right? We hate getting emails 10 times a day from different companies and brands. So it's something that we'll never do. Um, likewise, on social media, it's not just always about sort of bragging or you know saying hey buy this buy this or the beauty of social media is that it is a medium by which you can have a two-way conversation so we've sort of always viewed it in that way if we're disseminating information how is it helpful to the person uh, sort of receiving that information um, one of the things that we were really excited uh, about again is sort of this unintended consequence of treating others the way they want to be treated uh, was that people started on Twitter to ask us uh, different customer service questions and it's really hard to provide an answer in 140 characters. So just out of necessity, we started sh shooting these short videos and then tweeting the link to the person with a personalized sort of video answer. We thought that these short videos would get viewed maybe once or twice. Well, the person was so surprised to get it that they ended up sharing it. And on average, these videos are getting viewed like 60 times. So it ends up being uh, sort of a, a marketing initiative for us, even though it was really just about customer service. 
Warby Parker is often spoken about as being a lifestyle brand. What does that mean for a company that only sells glasses? Sure. Uh, I think it's a, a great question. And I, you know, I think we want to define our brand um, not, based, not in a transactional way, so um, that people don't think of, of Warby Parker just when you need to buy a pair of glasses. That's when you go to our website. That's when you go into one of our stores. Um, but we think uh, glasses are associated with um, just learning literature and we think a lot of tenets of our brand um, are, are deeply rooted um, in, um, in those same things. And the, the name Warby Parker comes from Jack Kerouac's private diaries. Um, they did an expose at the New York Public Library um, and in which uh, he, Jack Kerouac had written about characters that never made it into any of his published works. And that's where we discovered uh, the name Warby Parker. Um, and I think we we feel that uh, our our brand um, it just represents learning, um, doing good, creativity, fun, and uh, kind of a, a broader lifestyle. Um, and so, even though we are only selling one product category, um, we when people close their eyes, we don't want them just to think of a pair of a pair of glasses. Uh, we want them to think of kind of a, a much broader lifestyle that we're representing. Hi, um, I got my first pair of Warby Parker glasses just last week. And, Congratulations. Um, thank you. It was an amazing experience, I have to say. And I'm a mother of two young kids. I have a three-year-old and a one-year-old. And I finally feel cool for the first time in like three years. So thank you so much. Um, as a product professional, one of the things I think is most challenging is all the feedback that you get from your customer and how you figure out sort of what is your priority and what do you go for next in light of everything you're already learning from your data analytics, et cetera. Um, can you just, I guess, briefly describe how you prioritize all of the uh, features and different things that you can do and how you really set your direction so your scope is clear and you're not sort of going all over the place with it? Any day now, we'll figure that out. <laughs> I think that's the hardest thing when, when you're running a company, especially one that, that's growing quickly. One of the things that we start to do more and more is plan farther <laughs> in advance, which is, which is helpful. So um, one of the things that Dave and I think about is how can we empower everybody on the team to have the information they need to, to make decisions, to prioritize appropriately. So we have these core values. We also have two very explicit goals. One is to radically transform the eyewear industry and transfer billions of dollars from these large companies to normal people. And the second is to demonstrate that businesses can indeed do good in the world without charging a premium for it. And we think that's a powerful idea. And if we do that, then more and more executives and entrepreneurs will run their businesses in, in a socially um, positive manner. Um, the other thing that we do is that we set strategic objectives in priority order, and these are anywhere from six to 10 sort of objectives that we want to accomplish during the year. Um, and so if everybody on the team knows the strategic objectives for the year, if they know our core values and they know our mission, then hopefully they can make the, the right decision. Um, and it often comes down to how do we, you make customers happy. So that's one of the reasons why we haven't expanded into other countries just yet. It's one of the reasons why we're not in other categories just yet, is because we want to keep iterating, getting better and better, and staying focused. And it's a lot easier to do that sort of here within sort of the US and, and within eyewear. Well, thank you all so much again for being here. Thank you again to the Apple team for inviting us to speak. This has been a lot of fun. Um, again, we are just around the corner at 121 Green Street. That's where our flagship is in New York. We hope you guys will stop by and check out the glasses and just say hi. And uh, thank you guys. Great job. Thanks. Thank you.